Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this very important uh, exercise of continuing to develop the importance of women in STEM. And there's no better place in Canada, the University of Waterloo, to be focusing on this topic. We have some really amazing speakers uh, that will be speaking today. Um, I'm, my name is Lylan Masterman. I'm with White Star Capital. And we're a venture capital firm with offices in New York, here in Montreal, we're upstairs, and we're the host of this event in London, England, and Paris, France. And we invest across all the countries, and we have uh, six active investments in Canada already, and more to come. Um, before I make some of the introductions, I just wanted to share with you some some of, some of my views on this topic, um, and they're views that I that I published uh, in an article in Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, and so ultimately, my view as a venture capitalist, I'm a little bit biased about uh, not only women in STEM, but women who are founders of companies. And so there was this article around a year ago in the Wall Street Journal where a venture capitalist wrote an article, and this is not like a sentence within the body of the article. This was the title. Women in tech might consider just using their initials online. My female friends on Facebook and on Twitter demolished this guy, right? They're like, this is absolutely unacceptable. He ended up uh, posting an apology, and he had the best of intentions, I guess. But um, <laughs> I guess uh, that's what his apology said. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this is what he was communicating. And so I have a different perspective. And again, we all have our own biases. I know that women can be game changers, and I know it from the place that I studied, University of Waterloo Computer Science, from working in the first ever team that launched .NET and Visual Studio at Microsoft, and then I had five years at a company called Aquanta that you might not have ever heard of, but we got acquired for over $6 billion, so it was a good success. And I can guarantee you, the women that I work with and that I studied with, they're, they don't need to use their initials. It's an important key point. And so I look at the layers of bias. And I've never seen anybody express it quite this way. I, won't need, I don't need to read you through all four uh, circles in a diagram. But what's unique about this is that we know there's issues about uh, women who are uh, founding companies. There aren't enough women who are in computer science. There aren't enough women in the boardroom. Um, but also there's not enough women that are doing highly technical activities as part of their profession. And so I look at the intersection of all four of those in this. And so really, with, when you look at the intersection of these four circles, it comes down to the female technical founders of highly technical companies. And here's another <coughs> quote. This was from a conference. I, I don't want to name who said it because it, uh, it was during Q&A, so it wasn't something that she had planned to say. This was uh, a very senior venture capitalist, female VC in New York, who said it's obvious that female entrepreneurs are founders of startups in e-commerce, media, and fashion. And yes, it's great for men and women to be founders of these kinds of companies. But I was sitting in one of the back rows, and I felt like yelling at the top of my lungs, no, it's not obvious that female entrepreneurs focus on these areas. I think that female entrepreneurs should be founders of any kind of company. The ones that I studied with and I worked with at those two companies, they could be founders of any kind of company. You know, MongoDB and Twilio, their companies are founded by men, but the next versions of those kinds of companies can just as well be founded by women. I don't care what that female VC says, there's no reason for that not to happen. And so, I never want to be that man mansplaining things. But as a Waterloo computer science alum, I am never afraid to geek explain things. And that's my perspective here, right? I'm not afraid to geek explain. And so as a VC, I, I invest, my firm, White Star, we invest in all kinds of media companies and, and, and the, the softer tech stuff, and those are great investments. But at the same time, as a computer science alum, I'm attracted to many of the highly technical companies. And I want to see more highly technical women who are co-founders of highly technical companies just the way these two famous companies are, Mongo and Twilio. 
here are four pictures of four people. If I put Gates and Zuckerberg, you'd be able to name who they are without batting an eye. Can anybody name any of these people? By the way, I couldn't before I did my research um, before writing the article. So these are the four, based on my research, uh, it took me hours to, to do this research. If there's no list out there, I guess I publish a list, I guess. These are the four most successful, highly technical women who are co-founders of highly technical companies. The font's a little bit small, I think it's somewhat readable. Diane Green of VMware, she's now famous with her role at Google. She's actually on the Google Board of Directors. But look at her degrees, very, very technical, and in VMware, it's a very technical company. Wiley, another, she was named one of the 20 most successful founders in the world and all this kind of stuff. And she's the only female co-founder of a major semiconductor company. Again, computer science degree. Lynn, BS from Stanford Science Technology and Society. She's a CEO of Sunrun, publicly held company. And she, of course, she's a founder. All four of these are founders. And then Mary Lou Jepsen, who's one of the also one of the more female uh, female voices in tech. Uh, she has a bachelor's in engineering, a master's in science and holography, and PhD in optical science. And now she's an exec at Facebook Oculus, and she has, she has this one laptop per child program. But she was also a co-founder uh, of a company that had uh, an interesting peak. I want to see more help. I want to be investing in companies that are as technical as these four, that have leaders and co-founders like these four women. I'll end it with this. Uh, and this was the, the end of my article, and here's the link to my article. It's just, it's great, but it's not enough just to be simply hiring women. Right? We need to create an environment where men and women are, are viewed equally, and little boys and little girls are viewed equally in terms of the idea of starting to learn how to code and be passionate about math, be passionate about coding, be passionate about exploring technologies. And it requires the same sponsorship level, and you could say maybe even a little bit more, but at the very least, it has to feel organic for little girls and little boys to be equally interested in these things. So that we end up living in a culture where the founders, these four founders, are just as well recognized as a Zuckerberg and a Gates. And only then will we be able to take steps towards true equality with the full names and not just the initials attached. That's my perspective. Hopefully I kept it quite short because I have some really interesting speakers here. Um, and first of which is the Dean of, of University of Water and Math. Dean Stephen Watt conducts research in the area of mathematical software. Since 2005, he has held the positions of Dean of the Faculty of Math, my alma mater, thank you, at the University of Waterloo, where he's also a professor in the David R. Sheridan School of Computer Science. The Dean was educated at the University of New Brunswick, where he received a BSc in Math and Physics, and the University of Waterloo, where he received a Master's in Mathematics in Applied Math and PhD in Computer Science. In 1984, he joined IBM, at the T.J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, USA. And in 1995, he joined the University of Nice, Sophia and Spodis, and INR, IA in France. Dean Watt returned to Canada in 1997 as chair of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Western Ontario in London. There he led the department to double its activity and founded the Ontario Research Center for Computer Algebra. Watt has served on the board of directors of several public and private sector organizations, including Descartes Systems Group, MapleSoft, Waste Diversion Ontario, and the McMichael Canadian Art Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Wall. Thank you very much, Nyla. Uh, I'll make just one uh, little adjustment there. I've been at Waterloo um, in this role since 2015. So there was a, a zero one bit flip. It must have been a cosmic ray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, bienvenue à notre session ici. Uh, uh, C'est un grand plaisir de vous accueillir ici à Montréal. And thank you for coming out to our, our session sponsored by the University of Waterloo, where we have 
so many alumni and friends here. Uh, pink is uh, the color of the faculty of mathematics, and I'm wearing a pink tie today not only because uh, I'm representing the faculty of mathematics, but also because I am coming from Quebec, I call it my home, and so I'm authorized. So that's, uh, that's all right. Now, um, I, I considered uh, for an event like this uh, to uh, that maybe a better speaker for today uh, would be one of our associate deans for the faculty of mathematics, maybe uh, Christian Lignier, who's our uh, associate dean for uh, graduate studies, or Laurie, um, uh, Laurie uh, Case, who is our uh, dean for cooperative education. University of Waterloo places 21,000 students in the past year in cooperative education jobs. Um, uh, but uh, actually, uh, this is such an important event that I want to be here myself. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I might not have standing to, uh, to offer an opinion here, uh, but I certainly am very enthusiastic to do so. Now, um, there may be more bullet points in the prepared notes here than there are people in the audience, so you'll forgive me if I look down at my papers um, occasionally. Um, the, uh, the first note is that uh, we're in the 50th anniversary of our Faculty of Mathematics at, at Waterloo. So um, that's really quite a, a significant, uh, significant milestone, going from you know, the very first small class to now being uh, a quarter of the university, Waterloo. So we have 8,000 students in the Faculty of Mathematics. That's about one third of them are in computer science. About one third of our students are in the mathematics of business and finance, and about one third of our students are studying subjects in the other areas of mathematics, so pure mathematics, applied mathematics, combinatorics and optimization, one of your majors, uh, statistics and actuarial science. So it's really a, a very broad faculty with many things going on. In some of our programs, we have more women than men. In other programs, we have, we have not enough uh, women to be able to say that we really have an equitable, um, equitable position. It's, um, when we look at this, it's a bit of a, uh, a head scratcher. I myself, a Waterloo alumnus, I was there in 1986, I got my PhD. I might even have been a, a, a a, a paper grader for some of the people in this room. Um, at that time, there were more women in computer science than there are now. Um, also, but I also think, notice that when I go around the world and I give talks in China or Russia or Romania or France, there are actually more women in mathematics and computing than there are men. So um, I think that when we look at things from the perspective of the University of Waterloo, we have a bigger question, a bigger issue to address than simply what are we doing at Waterloo. It's really what's happening in our country that we don't have as many women applying programs like this or taking the courses in high school and having the inclination to apply. And so one of the mandates we have for our Center for Education in Mathematics and Computing in the Faculty of Mathematics is to reach down into the high schools and to be able to, to, be able to help the teachers for those courses and to be able to help the students to feel comfortable with mathematics and computing. In many parts of our country, we have uh, what is sometimes called an oversupply of teachers, meaning that with a dwindling student body and teachers who are still in their career, there are more, it's very difficult to get a job as a new teacher. And that means that we have people who are not comfortable with mathematics, often teaching courses in mathematics and computing. And so the main thing they teach the students is fear of the subject. And so we need to get beyond that. And so really, it would be difficult at any other university in Canada to really address this problem. But at Waterloo, we have enough of a mass that maybe we can. Maybe we can reach into the rest of the country and we can help sort of sway the way things are done so that girls in school don't opt out of the courses and, the, and, the cho and make choices that would leave all avenues open. 
I don't think it's anything that we're doing desperately wrong at the university level in our recruiting, although we can try as hard as we can at that level. But I think we have to think larger and think of the nation as a whole, and how do we get a more balanced attitude towards technical subjects for young women and girls when they're 10 years old and 12 years old and even before. So that's not part of the prepared notes here, but I, that's just how I feel and why I wanted to be here to say that you know, that's one of the benefits of being in Waterloo, that we have enough mathematical mass that maybe we can do something about these important questions. So in 1967, Waterloo was a startup university. You know, we, we, we were still just 10 years into the life of the University of Waterloo. We had these tiny classes. The first person to walk across the stage to receive a math was uh, Jean Elizabeth Anthes. Uh, since then, we've had more than 12,000 women alumni graduate from the Faculty of Mathematics. That's an incredible number. Where have they all gone? They're filling roles that are important in companies in Canada and around the world. Um, I, I had the pleasure to give a uh, presentation at the Bank of Montreal, one of their, their uh, uh, forums for quantitative analysts this morning, and um, I, I put up uh, a, a slide of some people who were working in quantitative finance and risk analysis, and I just picked some of our alumni, and it was without thinking about equity or gender or anything, I was able to put up Cindy Forbes, who's uh, Vice President of, uh, of, of, uh, of Data Analytics at, uh, at Manulife. I was just able to, to with, uh, together with, uh, with Dave McKay, who's a President and CEO of Royal Bank, and so on and so forth. So it was without even a thought that this just naturally came to the fore. I'd like that to be the new normal. That's not something that you have to sort of do and make an effort, it should just come naturally. So, um, one of the main issues that we have at Waterloo is quality, that we want to be, you know, we create an environment where students come in and you know, people say, well, what do you do at Waterloo that you've got such great alumni? And I always say, well, we just find the best students we can, we try not to screw them up too much. <laughs> and, and I think that's 90% of what we do. We actually teach them, so on and so forth. But, but I think the main thing is to find the best students we can. And, and so, um, uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to find the best women, the best young women to come in and to get them to apply to Waterloo from Canada and from around the world. Um, I've been on uh, several um, uh, board search committees and when you go to these search firms and you, you um, have some um, sort of equity aspects to the search, they'll trot out some old files to you and you have to, you have to be willing to push back and say, you know, no, you're not looking hard enough. You know, I, there, there are excellent people out there and go find them, all right? And I think we have to do the same thing at, at the university, that it's, it's not a, a question of just casting our net and seeing what swims in, that we need to go out and find the best students we can to bring into our university to participate in the environment that we are. Okay, there's lots of things I'm going to skip over here and get to the main event. Um, uh, there's... Um, I remember when uh, I first set foot at uh, the University of Waterloo, this is not in the notes, I'm just sort of anecdotalizing this. Um, uh, I was a, um, a student at the University of New Brunswick and I came for the, uh, the summer to work with uh, John Wainwright uh, to, um, uh, to collect, now you can't imagine this. These days you go and get a program, you sort of go to the App Store, the Google Play, and you sort of press a button and then 300 megabytes later on your LTE connection, you've got your app on your phone. Okay, well in those days, what you did was you sent an undergraduate halfway across the country to sort of work for a month in the computer, the red room, and, and bring back a tape, all right? And so that, that's how we downloaded a computer algebra program to the University of New Brunswick. And I was working with John Wainwright in the Relativity Theory Group. And there was, there was a, a young faculty member there who was working in the Relativity Group as well. It was a woman by the name of Bev Marshall. Okay, so uh, one of her students, Lisa Yao, uh, has been inspired by her support and launched a scholarship in Bev Marshall's name. She stayed at the University of Waterloo. She's now a, uh, 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 I believe, a retired faculty member in the Center for Education in Mathematics and Computer. 
computing that I mentioned earlier. And she stays on and continues to teach as a retired person doing this and that just because she loves to do it. And one of her students founded a scholarship in her name. She was so touched. I think that we have to look to our role models and see you know, what do they provide for us. And, and we've been lucky to have people like that with us. Um, another of these is uh, Rosemary Taylor, an alumna, and she established a bursary to help students with financial hardship. Um, one of the things that we, we want to do at the university is to never exclude a talented person for financial reasons. We're looking to bring in the most talented people in the world to study at Waterloo. Uh, people say there are a lot of foreign students at Waterloo. Well, as a country, that has one half of 1% of the world's population. It's hard to imagine that all of our students would be, you know, all of the most talented people in Canada in the world would be Canadian. A lot of them would be, but not all of them. <laughs> and, and so um, uh, we, we bring in a lot of foreign students, but we also have many very talented students in Canada. We would never want any student to be excluded from Waterloo who had the talent but couldn't afford to come. And so scholarships are increasingly important. You know, as the university sort of advances the, uh, and the entrance requirements become even more staggeringly uh, elevated, then the students that we want to, that, that, that can come in are, 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 are in need of scholarships in many cases. And so Rosemary Taylor, Taylor established this bursary to help students with financial need. And uh, the reason she did this was as a young woman from a farming community, she remembered being told by her parents that despite paying for her two brothers before her, they weren't going to pay for her to go to university. That's horrible. So she struggled through all the years, and then she often had to choose between like food and books and so on. And she never wanted anybody else to have to do that. Times have changed since then, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, if the stakes were high in Rosemary and Bev's time, they, they remain high now. Uh, we had our 50th anniversary celebration. One of the events in January was a panel. And one of the things that Bev Marshman said was that um, if it weren't for the scholarship that she got, she never could have come to Waterloo. And so when you think about this, you know, there's one person who comes to the university and then touches the lives of several people, and that person touches the lives of several more. It's like a cascade that leads to an avalanche. And so we have to make sure to bring in those seeds that lead to this exponential growth. So uh, the faculty of mathematics is established as one of its key priorities, the advancement for women in computing and mathematics. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've appointed our director for uh, women in computer science, uh, Joe Atley, who's here this evening, and will say several things to us uh, later on. Um, we know that in order to be globally recognized, um, we have to be globally recognized for both women and men. So our alumni have accomplished many things, uh, but there's a lot to be done so far. Um, uh, to be, there's a lot that remains to be done. Um, there are, uh, one of the things that we're be doing, we'll be doing now uh, is to establish the Center for Excellence of Women in Computer Science. This is the, the center was unveiled earlier this year and uh, this is some, one of the several initiatives that we have to, uh, to enlarge and expand and to uh, take on the challenges. We can't do it without, without our alumni. Now, in, um, in, in these kinds of, uh, of meetings, one of the things I have to really emphasize is that we have 250 faculty members at the University of Oregon, but we have more than 30,000 alumni, almost 40,000 alumni. So what carries the reputation of our university? Is it our faculty members? No. It's our alumni. And so uh, it's up to our alumni to help us carry our name on further. We have, uh, we have one of our alumni here, uh, Vicki Iverson, who earlier this year received the, our, uh, Graham, uh, uh, our, our Graham Medal. And we look forward to, uh, to what uh, she'll be having to say. And, uh, and I think that actually Vicky is up next on the agenda, if I'm not mistaken. Please correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Candy. Yes, yeah, so okay, I'm supposed to introduce Vicky. I was supposed to, make, I was supposed to do a little bit of a spiel about the university, which I've done.
now it's time to introduce Vicky. Now, now, the font on this is a little bit smaller, so, and, and there's so many amazing accomplishments here, I'm going to need to read a little bit, so please forgive me if I, I do that. So, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Vicky, as I said, one of our, uh, one of our alumni, of, one of our alumni of whom we're most proud. Vicky is co-founder and CTO of Iversoft, a trusted technology partner specializing in digital experiences. Uh, She's the brains behind the technical development. Vicky has led the team to design and develop more than 150 apps and games for clients worldwide. Since the company's inception in 2009, that's not very long ago, uh, Vicky has helped build a strong collaborative team and a growing profitable business. Vicky is a mentor and strong advocate for women in technology and actively encourages youth to pursue STEM careers. In recognition of her work, he received the Ottawa Chamber of Commerce 2016 40 Under 40 Award, the 2017 Women in Communications and Technology Entrepreneur of the Year, and the J.W. Gray and Medlin Computing and Innovation from University of Waterloo. Right. But he has a mathematics degree in computer science from the University of Waterloo, and a Master's of Science in Artificial Intelligence from the University of Toronto. I have to say, there's nothing wrong with the University of Toronto. <laughs> so, so, Vicki, welcome. Thank you.